Whatever it might be this morning. Don't you get discouraged. Don't you give up. Don't you quit church. Don't you quit serving God. You hang in there. Hang tough in these dark days that we live in. Take your Bible this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter number 28. The book of Matthew chapter number 28 uh, this morning. We'll look at the last part of this scripture. Um, this is called the Great Commission, rightly so, uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm bringing a challenge this morning. And um, here in the book of Matthew chapter number 28. We'll begin reading with verse number uh, 18. Matthew 28 and verse number 18. Please find your place there with me and look at the scripture. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, not a suggestion, not if you feel led, not if the weather's nice, not if, if you just have fun. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I'm going to preach this morning on this subject, mind your own business. When somebody says that, it's a normal saying. People say today, they, uh, famous, uh, people, famous people using that phrase, and it usually means when uh, you're caught, uh, you tell people mind their own business, or you're embarrassed, or you're made to look bad, or you're exposed, and our normal response is just mind your own business. Stay out of mind. That's, that's a normal thing people say. And that's usually told to nosy people, jealous people, busybodies who stick their nose in everybody's business but their own. I want to use it different this morning, and you'll get the thought here right now. A preacher one day was out knocking on doors. And this preacher knocked on the door. People, lady came to the door. And he started witnessing her, invited her to church. She said this. She said, wouldn't it be great if everybody just minded their own business? And that preacher looked back at her and said, ma'am, taking the gospel to every person and getting people to church and winning them to Jesus is my business. That is my business. Me and you, Shining Light Baptist Church, are in business. We have business to take care of. This is not a social club. This is not somewhere where people just meet uh, to, to, to sing and, and pat each other on the back and admire each other's new clothes or whatever. That, that, that's a further a business. This is a business. We are commanded by our commander to win people to God and get them in church. That is my business. I always said preacher would mind his own business. That's exactly what I'm doing this morning. This is my business. I came on business for the king. Like the old song said, we have a command from our commander. Now, I want to say a few things about it this morning, and I want to challenge you. I pray to God this week that somebody in here this morning would take this seriously. That some of you ladies, some of you teenagers, some of you men would take what I'm about to say seriously. And I'm trusting God to get a hold of your heart because I can't. I can't be tough enough and straight enough and mean enough to make you do it. But I'm trusting God will get a hold of your heart. Number one, number one, this is a big business. We are in the world today as the biggest business on planet Earth. There is no business bigger or greater than God's business. You hear me? I, I, I looked it up just to see. I sort of guessed anyway. The, the, the biggest business in the world is Walmart. And it showed all of their, their uh, how many billions of dollars every year of revenue and what's worth and all that. And those Walmart grand, those Walton grandkids are, are billionaires and stuff. And then, and then after that would be China Petroleum. Uh, and you know, you know, and that's our fault. Uh, a big, uh, and then there's Amazon, Apple, and then the illegal drugs uh, and all the, uh, the, the wickedness and stuff that goes on. That's big, big, big business. But I'm telling you, the business that me and you are in this morning, you listen to me, people, the business that you and I are in today is bigger than the United Nations. It's bigger than the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, uh, the, the British Empire, all the... Uh, the uh, all the, the, the Democrats, the Republicans, you know what our job is? He said go into all the world, every little nook, every little cranny, every little street, every little hideaway, every little community, every little, every little town, every city, and preach the gospel to every single creature. That is our business this morning. Listen, when you run a business, buddy, you, you must get the job done. I reminded that story in Luke chapter 2, over there in verses 48, 49, 50, long in there. You remember that story over there? And the Lord, they couldn't find him. Jesus, 12 years old, and his mother and Joseph got to looking for him. And they said, we can't find you. We can't find him. And, and finally, he's just 12 years old. And finally, they found him, and his mama said, son, uh, you, you had us worried there. Uh, where, where were you? And he looked back, and he said, uh, uh, mother, Joseph, 
He said, Mother, Joseph, he said, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's what? Business. His business. He said, I'm on business. He said, I'm only 12 years old, but I'm on business. Hey, all you kids in here that are 12 years old, 13, 14, 15, you're in the business. You have a business. Your job is to be in business for God. You hear me this morning? It is the biggest business. People say, Brother Danny, uh, I, I'm, I must, uh, why do you go knock on doors every Saturday? I, I wish you not that I must be about my father's business. You say, Brother Danny, why do you give out tracts everywhere, grocery store, post office, uh, convenience store, at the, at the gas station? Brother Danny, why do you do it? Because I must be about my father's Father's business. You say, Brother Danny, why do you witness to the waitress at the restaurant? I must be about my father's business. You say, Brother Danny, why do you stop at a truck stop and give a big old truck driver a track? I must be about my father's business. You say, Brother Danny, why do you put tracks in the restroom at the airport and at the, at the wherever you go? Because I must be about my father's business. You say, Brother Danny, why do you, why do we run these buses? I must be about my father's business. You say, Preacher, why do you, Ethan, take him side? up and nail them all the because I must be about my father's business. You say, why are you on the radio every uh, five, six days a week? Because I must be about my father's business. Why do we have revivals? Why do we have the youth rally? I must be about my father's business. It's a big business, y'all. We're in big business. You hear me? I read about a story from a, a lady by the name of Christine Turling. Tinley, and this story uh, wrote memoirs, memories of the mission field back in the 1930s, and she wrote about a missionary, Mr. Tornball, who was a missionary to Ping Lying, China, small, small uh, country in China, place 50,000 people, and um, they had just had an er earthquake a year or two before and devastated the country, and people were poor and didn't hardly have nothing, and he went as a missionary to this place and there were 50,000 people there that did not know God and didn't know anything about the Bible or Jesus Christ. He felt a burden. He said, I'm going to be about my father's business. And he said the only way he could get in there is go in like, they, like missionaries have done for years and years and years is being a, uh, by providing medical help. He had no training in medicine he had one book that showed about anatomy and how to, do, how to do minor surgeries and stuff like that. He had one book and his Bible and a few primitive little tools. But he went in there and he began to teach those people. And like a lot of missionaries do, you'd go into a place where they had no kind of medicine at all and you could help people. I mean, you'd help save lives just by simple things that uh, me, and, me and you would, wouldn't think nothing about. And uh, so he, he went in there and they brought him this woman who was almost blind. He, they said she could barely see out of one eye and almost blind. He took this woman and he said, they said he took her, he took some salve that he had took with him and started anointing her eyes with it. And lo and behold, within a few weeks, her sight was restored and she was healed. And the, the people couldn't get over it. They said, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So he preached the gospel to them. And people was getting saved. And then uh, uh, this woman, see, it was so bad. Uh, you you, you got to remember, everywhere wasn't like the United States is now, and, and a, lot of places, a lot of places still ain't. This woman stayed in a cave at night. And they'd carry her down there and set her downtown every day so people would give her a little, mood or, a little money or a little food. And they carried her back up to the cave and put her in a cave and put a big rock in front of it so wolves wouldn't just tear up. That's how she lived. So they brought her out and, and the guy helped her and she got well. And word spread around town that this man could help sick people. Then they brought this man who had fell in, in the ice and snow and been out and had froze his, his leg from here and, and had to have his had needed his leg amputated. It, it just turned it just turns completely dark, black almost, and you had to have it cut off. And he said he told him, he said, Now nah, I'll do the best I can. And they had surgery for that guy. He said, the only tools I had was a Swedish pen knife and a saw. He said, I used a hot salt 
solution to clean everything. I boiled these tools, and he said, I boiled them in hot water, and I gave the man everything I could for the pain, and that man was awake while they did it, and the people in the community all stood out, and he said, I sawed that man's leg off. He said, I got down, I, I went with that book, and it told me where to do it and how to fix it and how to bandage it up and everything. And they said he, it was a success. Somehow or another, he saved that man's leg and was able to lead that man to the Lord. And that man got saved. And all the, the, uh, the rulers of the, the, the uh, community rose up, and the devil got in them and said, you got to get out of here. Get this guy, get this guy out of here. We don't want him. Just like they did, see that, remember that in the Bible? In John chapter 9, when that blind man got healed, and they said, get him out of here. We don't want him. And that old lady stood up and said, hey, you better hush your mouth right now. We want people like him. This is what we need. We need, and so they let him stay, and he established a medical facility and a church right there in, in Pantling, China. Think about that, y'all. You know what that old boy did? That old boy said, I couldn't be at home uh, taking it easy in America, but I must be about my Father's business. Look, we only got one life, y'all. We're in the biggest business of the world. This is the biggest business. I'm praying God get a hold of somebody in his heart today and said, yes, preacher, I'm going to take it seriously. I'm on business for the king. Number two, it's an important business. It's the most important business. There ain't no business in the world as important as what we're doing here. I asked, people asked me one time, I said, but, but Danny, what would you do if, if would you, uh, and I always tell them I want to be a lawyer or something because I, I like to argue a case, but I'd have to step way down from being a lawyer from that pulpit right there. I'd have to take a step way down to be a prince or a, or a president of the United States. Way down. This is the most important business on planet earth, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. Listen here, in 1 Samuel 2, 8, 21, 8, it said the king's business requires haste. The king's business requires haste. Amen? Socially, we are to promote peace and Christian living and teach people how to live and get along. I got to thinking just about our little area right here. Do you know there is 90,000 people in Burke County who live here? I would be safe to say I'm sure I'm sure I would probably be safe to say this morning there is at least, at least 50 or probably 60 or 70 thousand people in this county sitting home today. At least. Since the Wuhan flu shut the churches down, maybe much higher than that. If you took all the total of all the people that are in church in Burke County this morning, there would be a minimum of 50 or 60,000 people sat at home today. I know preachers get mad because, well, that church member, they tried to get one of my members, they tried to get one, and, and you shouldn't do that. That ain't right. But Lord have mercy, all these 50,000 people, there's enough people in Burke County to build 50 more churches running 1,000. This is the most important work in the world. You listen? And there's 154,000 in Catawba. And we run a bus there. 154,000 people. And Ethan and them, thank God, brought a good crowd on their bus from down there this morning. 154,000? There's probably over 100,000 sitting at home in Catawba County. There's 83,000 in Caldwell, right over there, where we run Miss Sandy's bus comes from. 83,000. And Lord, there's probably 82,000 sitting at home over there. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, uh, their church attendance probably is higher than either one of these counties, probably. They, people got more sense call well uh, about God on, on the average. But I'm telling you this morning, people, we, we've got, we're, educationally, we're to teach people the business. Listen, the king's business must be done. The king's business requires hey, Now look, if you're in the army or the navy or the marines or anything like that, when your commander gives you a command, you are expected to obey that command. Listen, if we're in the army and our, our commander-in-chief says, you go here and you fight, we don't fuss, we don't argue, we don't say I don't feel led, we don't say I like my Saturday mornings at home, we don't say uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know good enough. Buddy, you put your uniform on, get your gun, bless God, go out there and fight. 
Look, people, we have a command from our commander-in-chief to take the gospel to every single home. Why do you think we run them buses? Lord, have mercy when the angels look down this morning from heaven and see those buses rolling out of the parking lot of Shining Light Baptist Church. I believe they're up there saying, go, boys, go, y'all, go. Get them, go, y'all. That is the most important. I don't think there's anything in this county more important than them buses rolling out of here on Sunday morning. Come on, preacher. Preach it. Let's get them read while we've got an opportunity to take the message to them. Amen. Amen. Am I right? Amen. Yes, sir, I am. You know I am. What a business. What a business. The king's chariot went down there and got Mephibosheth, the little crippled boy, and brought him to church. Lord, you wouldn't believe the stories that are back there in that junior church right now. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. We've seen some yesterday. Absolutely heart. Breaking, heartbreaking. Everything, listen, everything this church does and is involved in or supports is a means to an end. Churches have no business except God's business. Churches have no business getting involved in any business that don't work in God's business. Now, what am I saying? Youth rally. The youth rally gets kids together. A bunch of them get saved. Teaches them. It's not just so we can go eat hot dogs and ride four wheelers. And you know, at some churches they say we're going to have a youth activity. We're all just going to cut up and have fun. No, no. We're going to have youth activity. We might cut up and have fun, but we're going to take some tracks too. And get out when we have the couples trip. That's the strength in the couples. And we have fun, but we're going to take a guitar and some tracks and have a street service. Everything the church does and involved in is a means to an end to get people to Jesus Christ. That's our business. We don't have no other kind of business. We're, we're not interested in no other kind. We're not in the entertainment business. We're not in the athletic business. We are in business for God Almighty to get the job. Somebody help me. Somebody help us. God have mercy on us. Listen, we need to realize it's an important business. Amen. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Youth camp. Youth camp is fun. Lord, we write, make four, we make water slides, and they play ping pong and pool, and, uh, not pool, but ping pong and the foosball and basketball and, and hike and fish and run and play and have obstacle course and everything. But the reason we go to youth camp is to get the gospel in the hearts of them kids and challenge some of them to go become a preacher, become a missionary. Everybody in here can be a missionary to your home's home area, to the street you live on, to the people you live around, everybody in here, to the people you work with, everybody can be a missionary and should be. Thirdly this morning, I'll be through. It's a rewarding business. Our physical and spiritual needs are supplied here on earth when we take God's business seriously. You know what I've noticed? You know what God will do? He'll take care of a church or an individual that's trying to take care of his business. I found out if I'll take care of his business, he'll take care of mine. I, people used to tell me all the time, they said, Brother Danny, years ago when I had them girls, I said, they said, Danny, you cannot pastor a church, raise three kids, and be a full-time evangelist. They said, it can't be done. And I said, don't tell me that. I don't want to hear it. Well, you can't. I don't, I, you wouldn't believe the people that stopped me and said, you can't do this. And I always told them, I said, if I believe, and I still believe this, if I do what God wants me to do, God will take care of them kids. And he did. He did. We didn't perfect. We didn't bat a thousand. But if you will put God first and take care of his business, he will take care of yours. He did these missionaries. Spiritually, you receive a spiritual inheritance when you get to heaven. You'll reign with Christ and shine as the stars for a million years. They said in, did y'all hear this week? Bill Gates said this week, three, three days ago, because the, the, the pandemic is dying down a little bit, they hate that. Uh, and people are finally saying, heck with this, I'm going to work. And I'm going to do what I, I need to do, and I'm going to live my life. Bill Gates said this week, he said, there's a very, very strong possibility we're going to have another different pandemic. That's what he says. Did anybody hear that? Read that quote. 
Now, how does he know that? <laughs> Same way they knew the first one was coming, I reckon. Uh, how how'd they know that? You say, Brother Danny, please don't tell me. I'm not saying it. I hope he's wrong. But that's what the man said. The man who's buying up thousands of farmland and letting it set so they can't bring. The man who said years ago, we need the population reduced drastically, has just announced we're going to have another pandemic. You say, Brother Danny, what if they, what, what if they, what if I go out and I knock on somebody's door and they cuss me out? Well, look, y'all, look. Have you read your Bible in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4? The Bible said that they thought, you know what they done before Paul got saved? He hailed men and women and had them put in jail. Girls, women. He had women put in jail for witnessing. He had men put in jail for witnessing. If, if, I, if I got a, Lord, y'all don't even, you, most of y'all won't even do it and you don't even go to jail. What if I got up here and I said, they passed a law now, if you tell anybody about the name of Jesus Christ, you'll go to jail. Woo! But you know what they did? They went anyway. And the Bible said in chapter 8 and verse 4, they went every, they were scattered everywhere, preaching the word. Look, this world's not our home. We're pilgrims and strangers passing through. We don't even belong here. God have mercy on us to take our commandments seriously. And the king's business requires haste. Spiritually speaking, think about that. I thought about Nathan and Teresa and them in Romania. And I think they've been there nearly 30 years. Nearly 30 years. And y'all, y'all see them. I'm, I'm sure and you we I got one of the newsletters. I brought it with me. And they and bless their heart, Kelly always said. Kelly says, I love, we get the newsletters in the mail from missionaries. Well, Brother Carlisle's out there in the Philippines. Brother Dan up there going to different places in the world. And the missionaries that we support, you know why we do that? Because we're obeying our commander's command to take the gospel and preach it to every creature. Every time a missionary comes to this church and, look, I can't go to Romania and preach. I can't go to China and preach. I'm, this is my job right here, but I can give the man some money so he can go and take that. That's, why, that's how missionaries work. Listen here what Nathan says. Through our feeding centers, God has approved a way to reach the poor who would have no other approach to acquire necessities to survive. We provide meals and food, also clothing, children's diapers, and medications for cleanliness and healing. We do this graciously to provide an open door of help, and as the Lord leads, we share the gospel and invite them to church for service and prayer. We feed a lot of children as the parents are struggling to make ends meet with the increase of electricity and heating. As things grow stricter, I believe many more will be forced to come to these feeding centers for help, and we'll be able to share the gospel clearly to those who have no I have, no, have seen no need for Christ as of yet. 2021 was a strange year with the price of gasoline going over $6 a gallon. 30 years. Nathan's from up there in the mountains. I remember the night he got saved. Teresa was a bus kid in Marion for years. I remember her, her family, all her sisters. She got about three or four sisters and Beth, her mom. And they got together and, God's, and, and God said, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. And Nathan said, I'll do it, Lord. Yes, sir. And they've been doing it 30 years. Not here in America. Listen, people, I know God don't want everybody. I ain't, I ain't stupid. But Lord, have mercy. That You know what the better ought to do? The least, the least, the absolute least, every one of us in here today should be say, Preacher, I'll take some tracks. I'll be a witness at work. I'll, take the, I'll do my part. Surely the Lord we can do that. Surely to the Lord. I'm so disappointed in preachers of our generation. A, a man who says he's called to preach. We got them all over this country. I've, I've talked to them. I, I mean, big old guys out of shape. All they do is eat and ride around the cars and eat out and eat out and eat out and eat out. They son spend two hundred dollars a week eating out, eating out, eating out, eating out, and eating out, and never knock on one door. Never fast. 
can pray and tell somebody about God. And we, you claim to be a preacher? What in the name of God's wrong with us this morning? Listen, the first job a preacher has is to take the gospel to everybody he meets and can find. You know that's right. You know that's right. Lord have mercy. Claim to be a pastor. And they say, well, our church ain't growing. And the pastor won't even go visiting. What do you expect the people to do? We need some men. You know what we need in here? We need some men that will take these young men soul winning and train them how to be soul winners. Older men need to train younger men. Older women need to take some of these girls and teach them how to lead somebody to the Lord. Are you older lady? Come on, y'all. I'm, I'm in the book. I'm in the book. Listen. If Nathan and Teresa can risk their lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week, staying in a place where kids are running out, they said had... His boy said they had a kid come, nothing on but a T-shirt, no, no socks, no shoes, no underwear, nothing, and the mud, and it was freezing. And people started taking off their socks and stuff and giving it to that kid. I, I saw my wife do that yesterday, son. She didn't take her socks off, but she gave kid the clothes yesterday. Remember the story of Lottie Moon. If you grew up in a Southern Baptist church, I got saved in a Southern Baptist church, and all those old Southern Baptist churches used to be, and I guess many of them still are, have the, what they call a Lottie Moon offering. They do it once a year. And millions and millions of dollars have been sent to the mission field uh, in honor of Lottie Moon. And I don't know about how they all do it now, and I know a lot of it's messed up, but the original Lottie Moon, the person, was a tremendous person. Her name was Charlotte. Lot, the, Lot that's... Nicknamed Lottie. She was born in 1840 up in Virginia, and her daddy's front porch overlooked the Appalachian Blue Ridge Mountains. You know, from Virginia down into North Carolina, I know people say we're biased. They ain't prettier country on this planet than all, all this, the Blue Ridge Mountains. It don't get no prettier now. All, I count all four seasons, don't get no prettier. And her mother was a very, very strong Christian woman. Ladies, did you hear me? Her mother was a strong Christian woman and set Lottie on her lap and taught her scripture and how to memorize scripture. And Lottie Moon grew up as a little girl up there in Virginia loving the Bible and stories about missionaries. They didn't have no church. They lived so far out in the country, there wasn't no church near them. So their family gathered with their relatives and neighbors and had church at their house. One of the first women from the South to ever get a master's degree in college was Lottie Moon. She was extremely smart. And in the spring of 1873, she heard a preacher preach on John 4, 35. Lift up your eyes and look on the field, for they are white all ready to harvest. And she said, I'll go. First time she heard that challenge, she said, I'll go. She didn't sit back and say, man, I sort of got it made. I'll just stay at home and cook out and enjoy life and all that. Nothing wrong with it. I cook out too. I love it. But she said, I'll go. And she went to China. On the way to China, the ship got caught in a storm and she, it was tossing and going all over the place. And, and going, she thought they was going to, uh, everybody thought they was going to die. They really did thought this is it. And she said, I had a peace inside. She said, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if you could just look out there and saw the Lord walking on that water. She said, I had peace. And she said, he spoke to me and said, it is I, be not afraid. Forty years she stayed in China as a missionary. Forty years. She was 70 years old. Got sick. They had had, they had, had famine. Or they, they didn't have no food. She gave her food away and gave her last dollar that she had to help a family in need. And she succumbed to her sickness and died Christmas Eve, 1912, and said before she died, I wish I had a thousand lives that I might give them to the women of China. 
and she's still touching lives today. Your life has just been touched by her and mine. Dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord, please help us. Help us. Shining. Go to work tomorrow and say, it is my business. And mind your own business. That's exactly what we're doing. It is my business to tell you that Jesus is real and that he loves you and that he's coming back again. Man, I went through that flea market yesterday. I visited the hospital in Lenore. I put tracks all over the hospital over there in Lenore and on them little tables where people sit and read them. I give them to people. I talk. I, now I come back through. I went, went through the flea market. I give out a stack of tracks that big, just me, myself, at the flea market. There's enough people sitting in here this morning and watching me online that we could witness to a 1,000 people between you know, next Sunday easily, easily. Everybody witness. Everybody witness to one. We witness to a thousand people. There's enough people. There'd be a thousand people watch this online. People, don't just be a hearer of the word. Let's make up our mind. I'm gonna be a soldier. I'm gonna be a soldier. When I stop and get gas on the way home, when I go in that restaurant, I'm taking track. The track rack's full of them back there, and I'm gonna grab one of these like this. Look at that. Greatest story ever told. Here you are. Let me leave you something to reach. I'm scared. Well. They put them in jail in the New Testament. I don't think it's going to hurt you if somebody said, no, thank you, I don't want that. Is that going to hurt you that bad? Is that hurt? It's that a feelings get hurt. It's that a feelings get blessed. It's that a hard. I, look, what, what are we going to do when it really gets bad, y'all? What are we going to do? i tell you what most people do. They won't even come to church. We, we might be fixing to find out and separate the men and boys, y'all. God give me grace. I want to stay true. Let's take these things and say, look, here you go. I stopped and got gas with me and Frankie yesterday morning. And he rode me down here. And I said, Frankie, I got to get gas. And there was this big guy, big guy, pulled him around. He's, he's that big. And have you ever noticed nowadays when you're out, you can just look at somebody and tell they ain't from around here. I mean, he just his features, how long, how he looked like he's from Oregon or somewhere. Looked like some tree hugger. And, and, and the devil said, now, if you go over and give him a track, he's going to cuss you out. And I said, well, he probably will. I, I ain't going to mess with him. Here, here, boy, big, brave, bold preacher. And I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What if he does cuss you out? It would be an honor to get cussed out for the name of Jesus Christ. I've been cussed out for a lot less. <laughs> ain't you? Ain't you? Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's funny how people can go get drunk, get in fights, throw it out of bars and everything. As soon as they get to church, they turn into a little spiritual wimp. And I said, I ain't going to let the devil get the victory. And I went over and said, he goes, sir. No. I, I, thought he going, I thought he might hit me or something. I didn't do that. I said, here you are, sir. And he, he looked at me and said, I said, how are you doing? He said, fine. And I handed it to him and he took it and said, thank you. And I got my car and left. There's no telling where he's at right now. But he's got that witness in his car. You know why? I was minding my own business. It is my business. It is your business to tell your relatives how to be saved. It is our business. Let's get busy and do it. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Miss Desi's coming. She's playing softly this morning.